Um, you can find a lot of great tutorials on W3 schools, and I'm actually going to go ahead and, and uh, just resize this window real fast. So if we go back to our presentation here, um, we'll take a look at, at static first, okay? So if I take a look at a static element here, you can see that no matter where it's at on the page, it's going to just stay in its same order. Um, absolute, however, this div is positioned exactly where, whoops, exactly where it's supposed to be. So you see that it's positioned to the left, or from the left of the window by 10 pixels, and from the top, and this right here is being the window, okay? Now, if we look at relative, um, we've positioned it relative uh, on the position of the screen. And then initial is something that we didn't talk about, um, and it won't actually be tested on the exam. All right, so let's head back to the presentation. And finally, we're going to talk about content overflow, okay? And this is one of my favorite ones to talk about because um, HTML is actually inside of, of something called a bounding box, right? So um, every single element occupies a rectangular space called a bounding box. And so you can think of text with a highlighted background on a Word document or a page as, as like being a bounding box, right? Um, where the highlighting stops is where the bounding box ends. And with CSS, you can modify the height or width of the bounding box. And if an element, or rather the content of an element, doesn't fit inside of it, then that content is called overflow. Um, you can modify how the overflow is treated um, by using the overflow property in CSS. And here, we've actually set the overflow to something called visible. And I'll show you that here in just a second. Um, first and foremost, though, let's talk about scrolling overflow. Right? So sometimes you go ahead and you set all the content inside of a box. Um, or sorry, you have a, a ton of content that won't fit inside of your defined box, right? That content either goes nowhere, it overflows outside of the box, or you can set the, the overflow property to scroll, which creates a scrolling box as featured here in this right side of the window, okay? With visible overflow, you have the content goes outside of this light gray box and overflows. If it's hidden, then all of a sudden the content gets truncated and is completely cut off. And I'll actually just go ahead and show you all these different overflow values um, in the same demo. And I apologize, I forgot that I was going to do that. Um, I set it up so that you guys can go ahead and copy, um, copy all my CSS code here and then go ahead and add um, you know, go ahead and eliminate the other two that you don't want to demo yourself. But let's go ahead and go back to Web Matrix. And let's take a look at our overflow demo. All right, so I have a bunch of content here that I'll show you. Um, I just have the lorem ipsum text, and you guys can just go ahead and do a quick, um, do a quick Bing search for lorem ipsum. And you can just write text afterwards, and you can find all of this stuff. And it's great for being able to do a lot of web testing and just sort of honing your skills and sharpening your skills. So uh, keep that in mind. <clears throat> but notice here that I've set it to scroll. Um, and first, let's actually, I'm going to cut that for a second so you guys can see what this looks like without any modification. So I'm going to launch this in the browser. So here, it overflows, right? So it's visible as a default. So I'm going to come back here, and I'm going to change the overflow property to scroll. So now I'm going to come back to Internet Explorer. I'm going to hit refresh, and all of a sudden I have a scroll box, which is pretty darn cool. Now let's go ahead and set it to visible. Once again, we already saw that because that's the default setting for the overflow property. Right, looks exactly as we had seen before. And then now we're going to go ahead and set it to hidden. Refresh the page, and all of a sudden it's hidden. So it's pretty quick and easy to, to handle overflow. Um, it's really important that you make sure to do that because there would be nothing more frustrating as a user than going and reading an article 
and seeing that the text is cut off, that would be a pretty big nuisance, right? So keep that in mind. It's also a great way to, to go ahead and um, contain the, <clears throat> excuse me, manage the size of a, a bounding box and add scrolling as a feature in order to make sure that an article doesn't go too long on a page or that somebody doesn't have to scroll forever on a web page, right? Um, you can just take a look at a section inside of a page uh, and scroll through that um, just as easily as you would an entire web page. So keep that in mind. All right. So we're at the end of, of module four. As a quick recap for objective 3.1, understanding the, the core CSS concepts, we talked about cascading style sheets selectors and declarations, fonts and font families, um, content flow, positioning, and then content overflow. Thanks, it was great having you. I'll see you again in module five. Welcome back to module five of uh, HTML5 application development fundamentals. I'm Cullen, and we're gonna get started right now with understanding CSS essentials. Um, focus on layouts and the user interface today, okay? Um, so we're gonna start off by talking about the UI, the user interface, um, the CSS box model, then move on to the Flexbox box model, a new feature in CSS3. And finally, we'll talk about grid layouts. All right, without further ado, the user interface. Um, the user interface is the portion of a web page that we interact with as users. There you see the Microsoft Virtual Academy website there on the right, a nice little screenshot. Um, it's, it's essentially the way that the page is laid out. Um, layouts range from minimalist with just a couple of elements here and there to more complex pages that are just jammed full of content. And I'd, I'd say that the, uh, the Microsoft Virtual Academy is very cleanly developed, so I applaud whoever worked on it. Um, it, it lies somewhere between the middle of a, a minimalist layout and something that would be more complex. All right, um, a quick note here, we're gonna talk about some features that may or may not still be experimental based on the time of, of you viewing this video. Um, as with HTML5, CSS3 is still in draft format, and so it might not be compatible with all browsers, so we have to use these things called vendor prefixes, right? These are uh, workarounds for these compatibility problems. So. Um, what we have to do is, is if we're using a, a property name that is still experimental, we have to add a vendor prefix in front of it. Of course, that's what makes it a prefix, right? But it's simply a keyword that's surrounded by dashes, and, and we've got this nice little chart over here on the right to help you out in case you find anything confusing at all, right? Today we'll be using the Microsoft prefix um, since we'll be checking out our code examples on Internet Explorer. Um, let's talk about the CSS box model first. Um, the CSS box model defines the rules for how content appears on a web page, right? So um, it's not just that we have text on a page, it's a lot more complex than that. Um, and each element of HTML is a box that contains multiple components. Okay, so you have your content here on the inside. So this would be like uh, a paragraph of text. And then outside that, but in between, the content and the border is something called padding, right? So if you added border around an element, um, you can change the padding of the content in order to provide a little bit more space between the words, per se, and, and the border on the outside. And then next, you have the margin. And the margin is, is really the area that sits between the element itself and another element. Um, and we'll, we'll sort of experiment with this a little bit later, and hopefully I'll be able to show you a really good example that'll help it stick. All right, so um, let's go back and revisit block level and inline elements. So previously I talked about block level elements, and uh, with the box model, block level elements create boxes that are a part of a page's layout. And so this is your, your headers, your articles, your sections. Um, paragraphs are also block level elements as well, and so we've got this nifty chart over here. Um, quite a few things we're familiar with. Um, block level, a good way to think of that is that 
if you add one of these elements to the page, it's naturally going to create its own line, right? Like it's, it's going to be underneath the element previous to it, okay? Um, inline elements, on the other hand, are, are simply used to format content. And so this includes our, our, uh, our elements like emphasis and, and uh, maybe images, right? And then also links, you got the A tag there. Um, strong if you're trying to boldface something. Um, those are all inline elements. And so if you want them to appear on their own line, you would have to use the break tag, right? I jaw it out there. A little bit better than my last attempts at writing with my fingers. All right. Um, and within this box model, we have, uh, there, there are certain relationships that we have to pay respect to, right? It's, a, it's called a parent-child relationship. Sometimes you'll place one box or one element inside of another, right? So nesting in, in HTML. And, and the outer box is referred to as the parent, which nests the child, right? So the child box is inside of the parent box. What's really important about cascading style sheets is that a child element is going to inherit CSS styles from the parent. Okay, what that means is that if we style a parent element to say have a, a blue underline, the child element is also going to inherit that style. Now it's not the case for all CSS properties, but it is something that we do have to pay really close attention to and just be aware of in case we start styling um, wildly and, and we end up noticing some, some things that don't look quite right, okay? So, there are a couple of problems with the CSS box model, and it's that some browsers are going to apply properties differently, right? So height and width are, are supposed to be separated attributes, um, but sometimes they aren't treated as such by older browsers. Uh, you aren't going to really stumble into this problem too often, but if it does happen, you definitely want to be aware of it, and you want to make sure that, that you're, you're ready to handle it um, in your code, right? So. All right, so now we've talked about the user interface. We talked about the box model. Let's talk about flex boxes. Flex boxes are new in CSS3. CSS3 now includes the flex box box model. Try saying that 10 times fast. It's really hard. Um, the flex box box model is a layout mode that provides flexibility when a user changes the size of their browser window. So you might start off with a browser window that's I don't know, however many pixels wide um, this box is that I just drew. Well, if we expand the size of that window, sometimes we want our content to expand in order to fill it as well. And so you have certain elements like uh, navigation bars, forms, and pictures. You want them to resize and reposition based on the amount of space that's available. Uh, we use something called media queries um, within CSS3 to help us determine which kind of device is being used. So then all the content on our page automatically adjusts our HTML document in order to fit the screen. Okay. So an element is defined as a flex box using the display property. Okay, we'll, we'll go ahead and demo this here in just a little bit, but the display property possesses two values. You've got flex box and inline flex box. Okay, a flex box is going to be a block level element and then an inline flex box is going to be an inline level element. Um, and so what that means is that if it's inline, maybe you could set it inside of text, um, whereas if it's block level, it's gonna be on its own its own line of text unless you're using a float property to float it to the left or the right of the screen. Um, I'm just real quickly going to review a couple of these Flexbox properties and values. Uh, you could definitely download